What is good, everybody? I hope everyone is having a great weekend. Hope everybody is having a good mood right now. I know I am in a very good mood right now. Um, this topic is very important, and I think it's, a, it's something that needs to be recognized. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Shout out to Michael McGarry. Shout out to Love and Nigel, Miss Shauna. I appreciate everybody that's in here. So what is today's topic? So today's topic is why every black person should be proud of Liberia. And if you look on the thumbnail, you'll see that I have Joseph Jenkins Roberts Monument. Underneath it, I have peak black excellence. And then on the left side of the thumbnail, I have a picture of graduates of Liberia College. And then on the right side, I have the Nkrumah, uh, what was known as the Tubman Nkrumah Torre Conference in 1959. And that was held in Sanaqueli, Liberia. And I'm going to get into that later. So before I begin and delve into things, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you comment down below. Tell us what you think. And of course, sign up to the website at baioafricstand.org slash register. We would really appreciate if you would sign up. Our goal is to connect African Americans and those in the diaspora with Liberia through history, education, and initiatives. So I want as many of us to be a part of it. And we have reached 1.1, uh, 1.7 uh, K followers. Let's see if we can get it to 1.2 and then all the way to two, and then let's get it all the way up to 10,000. So today's topic is why every black person should be proud of Liberia. Oftentimes, when you hear about Liberia's history, it's usually delved into negative perceptions. It's usually delved down to America Liberians or the African Americans or repatriates versus the indigenous population. And oh, it was similar to Jim Crow and it was a similar to apartheid. And I'm going to be breaking stuff down through slides, through quotes, through negotiations that that simply wasn't the case. I also did one on Twitter. I have a Twitter thread that I did just yesterday showing Liberia's importance in Pan-Africanism and why Pan-Africanists should quit doing a disservice and undermining and undervaluing Liberia's Pan-African experience. So let's get right to it. So I'm going to break it down into a couple of, 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 of topics. The first topic is going to deal with what is the benefits of sovereignty? What is the benefit of having your own government? And then we're going to break it down to Liberia as a republic. And then after we break down Liberia as a republic, I'm going to then break down, you know, how Black Americans saw it, how people like Amy Ashford Garvey saw it, how people like Mammy Damina saw it. And we're really going to delve into stuff that oftentimes is not talked about, oftentimes isn't heard about. And if you don't read a lot of scholarly work, you are not going to know it. You're simply not going to know it. Uh, doing a quick Wikipedia is not good enough. You cannot rely on Wikipedia. You really need to read archives. You need to read journals. You need to read reports. That's really the only way how you're really going to understand Liberian history from an accurate, honest perspective. So I just want to make sure that I, I let that be known. So let's get to it. Now I have a lot of stuff to get through, so um, bear with me. It's just it's just that important that, that we have this conversation, um, and I have all of these. So... What I have right now is, let me share my screen with y'all. Yeah, anybody can add to Wikipedia, but yeah, Wikipedia is used as a valuable source. And I've always said people need to go on primary and secondary sources. Um, well, not really secondary sources, primary sources and sources written at the time. You have primary, secondary, tertiary sources that people should be going by. So let me do this for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
Let me give it to you. And um, yeah. Oh, crap. Well, should have done this before, <laughs> but it is what it is. I hope we get more people in here. We got five people watching right now. Which it was a little bit more. Um, but we only got five people in here right now. Um, <clears throat> we'll get more as, as time progresses. Um, why is that? My thing is doing some chicanery right now, folks. So just 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 be aware of the foolishness. Okay, y'all. Now we can get in. Now we can really dive into the real meat of it now. So I have a huge presentation. It's gonna be, it has at least 20 slides on it. I did that for a reason. Um, so bear with me on that. All right, so here we go. Only four people. Okay, so we have Liberia and Pan-Africanism. Whenever it, it loads, it will load. Um, but basically, it's going to say, well, it's really Liberia and Black Pride. So Liberia and Black Pride, and that's what it is, why every Black person should be proud of Liberia. It's peak uh, Black excellence. Liberia really set the tone. It set the example. So everybody should be repping Liberia. Everybody should be repping the Liberian flag. Everybody should be repping uh, Monrovia and Nimba and Grand Gita and River Cess and all the 15 Liberian counties. So first of all, we need to understand what is sovereignty. And here are the characteristics of sovereignty according to political science. Sovereignty, sovereign authority is the ultimate. There is no upper limit to this authority over citizens. Sovereignty is when you have supreme authority okay sovereign power is when it is eternal and unlimited sovereignty cannot be limited at certain grounds so sovereign authority and sovereign power is when you are the ultimate authority there is no upper echelon sovereign authority and sovereign power is the max it is the peak it is the top it is the creme de la creme of power Sovereignty is above the law and is not regulated by law. It is for this that the state can legislate. The laws do not control sovereign power. The sovereignty of the state is unalterable. State authority cannot be transferred to a person or organization within its geographical boundaries. There are different types uh, of sovereignty. There is titular, there is internal and external, or titular, um, internal and external, legal and political, de jure and de facto. Now, de jure means it is official. De facto means it is quasi, but it's not official. And then you have popular sovereignty, okay? Popular sovereignty, of course, the people, de jure and de facto, de jure being official and de facto being quasi. Legal and political means you control the politics and legal system. Internal and external means both internal affairs and abroad. Entitled means sovereignty, but only as a title. They don't really have no power or control. There are other additional sovereignties to consider. Consumer, food, economic and monetary. Do you control your own money supply? Do you control the economic policies within your com in your country? Do you control the food and how things are being produced? Do the consumers have any sort of say in what's going on? These are additional sovereignties to consider. And then we have the overall benefits 
of being an independent country. An independent country can control its own economy. An independent nation can manage its own affairs. Sovereign states can better protect their culture. Independent countries can choose their own government. A sovereign nation can make its own international relations. Independence helps nations defend against aggressors. And independence means a people will not be a minority. Let me repeat those again because it is really important and I'm going to hamper down on them. Independence, an independent country can control its own economy. An independent nation can manage its own natural resources. Independent, uh, sovereign states can better protect their culture. Independent countries can choose their own government. A sovereign nation can make its own international relations. Independence helps nations defend against aggressors. And independence means a people will not be a minority. If we were to apply this to the current situation of Black America and African Americans within the United States, independence and sovereignty would be the clear answer to our situation. We complain about how we, we can't protect our culture, that there are culture vultures and people exploiting our culture. We're upset that laws are not being passed, no matter how hard we advocate. We complain about the fact that our money is not being used to our benefit. We complain about the fact that systemic racism is systemic, it's endemic, and it controls our lives. And that is because of everything mentioned here. We are a minority. We're not a country. We're not a country, so we're not the majority. We're not a country, so we can't legislate when it deals with our culture and who can benefit off of our culture. We don't have the people who we determine can be allowed or not. We don't have the means as an independent country to control our own economy, to dictate economic and industrial policies, to see how economic resources are being distributed, acquiring human capital. We don't control none of that because we're not an independent nation. We can't manage natural resources because we don't own any land. Black people own less than 1% of the land in this country. It's like the top few richest landowners have more land than all 40 million plus black people in the country. We don't have natural resources to mine. We don't have mineral rights. We don't have none of that. We don't control the government, so we're upset about the electoral college system, us being disenfranchised, us having to get long voter lines, us being purged from the voter rolls. Black felons being recently released from prison, being arrested for voter fraud that they didn't commit. You have AP African American studies being kicked out. You have people attacking the 1619 Project. All of that is because we do not control our destiny and are a sovereign nation. When you are a sovereign nation, you control your destiny. You control, you control how your society is ran. You control how your society is dictated. Without independence and sovereignty, that is not going to happen. It's not. It's wishful thinking. And this nation within a nation is not going to work. A nation within a nation in America is not going to work. We do not have the numbers. We do not have the political power. It's not in our advantage and it's not going to work.
So now we're going to talk about Liberia as a republic. So Liberia was officially came to be about in 1822, the settlements along the Windward Coast. Between, well, it's really Cape Mezzarato Junk River. That is where Liberia was founded, okay? Before then, you had different nations. You had different kingdoms. You had the... The, the Mende people that came together to form the Congo Confederation. You had the Basa Kingdom. You had different kingdoms, clans that made up that area that we called Liberia in the Windward Coast. At this time, you had the slave trade going on. You had barracoons all over the Windward Coast stretching from Cape Mount in northern Liberia, which today we call northern Liberia, all the way down to the Gabala in the Ivory Coast, Cape Palmas, Sestos, Grand Basa. It was going on and it was rampant, okay, as Liberia was being established and as they were making treaties and agreements with people that supported them, that supported their goals and supported their causes. As this was happening, Monrovia is established. It officially gets its name in 1824. And then you have other separate settlements from different states. So you had the Georgia Colonization Society. You had the Maryland Colonization Society. You had the New York Colonization Society. You had the Pennsylvania Colonization, uh, Colonization Society. They come and they create their own separate uh, settlements on uh, the Windward Coast outside uh, of uh, Cape Mezzarato, Monserrato. Monrovia, and then you have places like Virginia, you have Buchanan, you have Mississippi and Africa, known as Sino, you have Kentucky and Africa that becomes Clay Ashland, you have Arthington, you have Carysburg, you have all these different regions, you have uh, the in, uh, Maryland and Africa, the independent state of, of Maryland, all the way down near Cape Palmas, near uh, in the Cavallo area, where we know today as the boundary between Liberia and Ivory Coast. These were all separate settlements in 1839. They eventually come together. They become a commonwealth. And they comprise of three original counties. They comprise of Monserrato, Grand Bassa, and Sino. In 1847, this is when Liberia officially gains its independence from the private organization called the American Colonization Society that was founded in 1816 by Robert Finley and a bunch of other uh, white abolitionists and slaveholders. They included people like Bourgeois Washington, James Monroe, James Madison. Uh, Bourgeois Washington was the nephew uh, of, of George Washington. You have Francis Scott Key that was part of this society. You had Andrew Jackson, um, who were part of that society. Eventually, Abraham Lincoln is going to become part of that society as well. So Liberia is going to gain its independence. The Liberian Declaration of Independence was really coming around in early July. This was a month before the Liberian Declaration of Independence is signed on July 26, 1847. They hold the Constitutional Convention in 1847. Now, in 1845, 1846, the American Colonization Society, the board basically decide to hand the powers over to the repatriates, and that is going to be explained about in the journals by um, by John Lugenbeal and and the documentation that was recorded. Now, with Lugenbeal, that's all we have. We only have his account. According, there have been two other copies of, of what was going on at the Constitutional Convention. One was supposed to go to England, and that never made it. That got destroyed. And then another one was destroyed by a servant because that servant mishandled it. So we only got the account of Dr. John Lugenbeal. Legend of you. And what we know about the Liberian Declaration of Independence is the Liberian Declaration of Independence was appealed, addressed to the nations of the world to recognize Liberia as a member of family nations with all the rights and privileges of a free and independent sovereign state. They were declaring to the world that they were an independent nation, an independent republic like Great Britain, like Haiti, like Denmark, like the United States. Liberia's Declaration of Independence included all Africans from the beginning. And the Liberian Declaration of Independence was not just inspired by America. Oftentimes people say it was copied from America. That is factually incorrect. It was included, it included so many different aspects that people forget about. 
it wasn't just the the American Declaration of Independence, although that, that was a factor in the American Constitution. It was also inspired by republicanism, the Enlightenment period. It was also inspired by the Magna Carta in, in Great Britain. That was also a part of it. You, so it, it was simply more than just the Declaration of Independence, okay, it, uh, the American Declaration of Independence. And people do a disservice when they strictly say it's based off the American Declaration of Independence when it wasn't. It was based off a variety of different documents during the Enlightenment period that they based it off of. Because remember, some of these signers were Hillary Teague, John Day, Ephraim Titler, uh, John and um, John and Lewis. You had John P. Gripon. You had Beverly Wilson, although Beverly Wilson copied the Constitution written by uh, Sir Greenleaf. You had Amos Herring. You had Jacob Prout, who was the secretary. You had Richard E. Murray. These people were highly educated. Now, one of them wasn't, uh, Beverly R. Wilson, but they were very educated. People, especially like Hillary Teague, would inspire people like Edward Wilmot Blyden, who people consider to be a major figure in Black nationalism and paid Africanism that would inspire people like Garvey and generations to come. But Edward Wilmot Blyden gets his inspiration from Hillary Teague, who he worked with. And Hillary Teague founded his own newspaper called the Liberian Herald, which is one of the oldest newspapers in on the continent of Africa. If people really want to get that, it, it's one of the oldest newspapers that was founded. It was founded really early on when Liberia was still a, a commonwealth. So oftentimes people will say that with that, and they also will say that like the indigenous population in Africa, other Africans were not included. That is factually incorrect. And if you read the Liberian Declaration of Independence, it says it. Now, you can make a criticism that it wasn't to the extent, but it was there. And it's factually proven that it was there, okay? It wasn't just strictly talking about African-Americans. It did say it centers around the African-American story, but it also includes the indigenous population and recaptured Africans as being part of that story. And here are some excerpts from the Liberian Declaration of Independence. From time to time, our numbers has been increased by migration from America and by ascensions from native tribes. Oh no, Greenleaf did not write the Constitution. I'm talking about Beverly R. Wilson's, what they said he copied. But Hillary Teague is the author of Liberia's, uh, of Liberia's Constitution, Declaration of Independence, but Greenleaf was, and even then with him, I suspect he even was involved in that. Um, the Constitution, oh, I believe that. Yes, yeah, yes, it was. Oh, yes. He also wanted to make, he also wanted to make a clause in there for the American Colonization Society to want to be, you know, still have a little bit possession uh, of, of Liberia and Hillary T and John P. Gripon said, we're not having it. They they wanted that clause that basically said, hey, you know, the American Colonization Society can still, you know, have a little bit of control over Liberia. And Hillary T, John P. Gripon were very vocal about that and said, no, you're not doing that. We are a separate nation. Everything from this point on has to deal with the Republic of Liberia. Strictly, if you, the American Colonization Society, have to work, you're going to have to work with the Liberian government. As it pertains, again, to the indigenous population, you have a second mention of the indigenous population. His providence, the native African bowing down with us before the altar of the living God, declared that from us, feeble as we are, the lights of Christianity has gone forth, while upon that curse of curses, the slave trade, a deadly bright, has fallen as far as our influence has extended. Okay, so I want people to understand this. The indigenous population is included in the Liberian Declaration of Independence and acknowledges the role that they played. 
They were considered, and they said numbers. So they are citizens of this republic. They're not just people that are, they are citizens. They were citizens of this, okay? They were bowing down with us. Okay, so they're talking about peaceful cohabitation. They're not saying we're just, we're just here and, and they just live in our, they said bowing down with us. They were side by side. This was going on when you had people of, before you had the King Peters of the world, King Bristol, who welcomed and saw us as, as people, as brothers. This was documented, okay? So when people say that Liberia's Declaration of Independence excluded the indigenous population, that is factually not true. They were mentioned at least twice on numerous occasions. Now, once Liberia becomes an independent nation, Liberia galvanizes the black population in America. It galvanizes the black population in other regions in the Caribbean, the West Indies, and South America. Okay, you're going to have towns in America that are named after Liberia that many African Americans don't know that were founded during slavery and reconstruction post-Civil War. You have Liberia, South Carolina. You have Liberia, Florida. You have Liberia in Little and Baja, California. You have Liberia, Georgia, which was a middle-class Black neighborhood during this time was founded. You have Liberia, North Carolina. You have Liberia, Connecticut, in Bridgeport that was being named. So understand Liberia has captured the imagination of black people. People who were originally against Liberia, once they gained their declaration of independence, would support Liberia. Martin Delaney would infinitely, when you had the integrationist, assimilationist points of view said, a toast to the United States of America, Martin Delaney stands up and says a toast to the Republic of Liberia. You have Henry Highland Garnett, who infamously quote, I'd rather be a free man in Liberia than be a slave in America. And Henry Highland Garnett would go to the African continent in Liberia and would die there. You have Martin Henry Freeman, who was the first president of an American college. He leaves and go teaches at Liberia College and dies in Liberia. You have Alexander Cremel that goes there, who teaches, of, who teaches religion there. You have people like John Brown Russell, who came back in the 1830s, but he's really going to kick off as well. And he's going to become the first, well, really the major leader of the Republic of Maryland, the second independent country in Africa. You have people, Susan Vesey, the wife of Denmark Vesey, who's already there. You have Benjamin Turner, the father of Nat Turner, already in Liberia. So Liberia becomes a vocal point of black thought. There are constant conventions in the 1850s on whether or not black people should stay in America or we should go to Liberia. So I need people to understand just how important Liberia was, especially after it declares its independence and it's a sovereign black republic. Remember this, Liberia is home to the wealthiest black Americans anywhere on earth at this time. You have people like E.J. Roy, who is a successful merchant. He's able to afford his own ship. You have the McGills, Arias McGill, who's a successful merchant. You have Joseph Jenkins Roberts, who's a successful merchant. You have Hillary T., who's a successful merchant, writer, speaker. 
This is what's going on in Liberia. So it's no wonder why many towns are named after Liberia. And most importantly, people go there. And Liberian independence is going to be celebrated in black communities. We have forgotten just how influential Liberia was. There were Liberians. Liberia's independence was celebrated frequently throughout the South during uh, during after the Civil War or during Reconstruction. You have a Liberia Day in New Orleans. There was also a Liberia Gala. You have Liberian Independence Day being celebrated in Charleston, in Savannah. The Liberian flag is being waved. You have people in Charleston who are preparing to depart to go to Liberia. This is what's going on. You have petitions going on. You have something called Liberia fever. Liberia fever extends, y'all, as far west as Colorado and as far north as Massachusetts. That is how widespread Liberia fever was. You had it in Kansas. You had it in Oklahoma. You had it in Texas. You had it in Arkansas. You had it in Mississippi. You have it in Florida. You have it in Georgia. You have it in South Carolina. You have it in North Carolina. All of this is going on. You have petitions, 98,000 African Americans, known as the S. Exo dusters sign a petition saying we are ready to go. We are ready to start our new lives in Liberia. And I haven't even started on the Caribbean. You have people from the Barbados who are leaving. You have people from St. Kitts and Nevis. You got people from Jamaica. You got people from Guyana. You got people from St. Lucia, you got people from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you got people from Grenada, you got all of these different Caribbean groups that are making their journey to Liberia, or they're advocating heavily, starting their own civil societies. You have the African Civilization Society in the United States, you have the United Transit and United Transatlantic Society, you have the Exodusters led by Henry Adam and you have people like the Integration, uh, the International Migration Society, led by Henry McNeil Turner. As one of my great scholars has said, Liberia has intentionally been wiped away from the black consciousness. Liberia has been wiped clean off the black imagination today. If you were to look to the average black American, they would not have a single clue about Liberia. And if they heard about Liberia, they would have been indoctrinated with the white supremacist propaganda narrative of, of, of black apartheid, of black segregation, this misnomer, quoting social Darwinists to justify Liberia. As Michael McGarry said, the 20th century tarnished Liberia's image. And it did. In the 19th century, Liberia was looked at as the shining beacon of light. And we're going to go further on the more influential aspects. So, yep, with slavery ending in the civil rights movement, integrationists ran free. They ran free and they ran wild with it. Liberia doesn't, doesn't even get mentioned in the story. Yeah, they did integrationist movements kept us here essentially and the thing that bothers me and upsets me is we're still talking about the same things that they were complaining about you had frederick Douglass, who literally said in 50 years after slavery black folks would be ruling america 
I kid you not. Frederick Douglass said out of his own mouth, in 50 years, black folks would be running America. We would be ruling white men. You had black leaders, and I, I don't even call them leaders, that's not calling me respectability functionaries, because that's what they were. They were on respectability. Oh, you shouldn't be running. You should be work hard. You know, you should lift yourself, pick yourself up by the bootstraps. Type of leaders were running around telling the black community that we should basically stay here, be grateful, and try to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps. Frederick Douglass, bless his soul, was vehemently anti-African. And it needs to be, that man was vehemently anti-African. He was the most Captain American Negro. If you want to talk about the Captain American Negro, it is Frederick Douglass. Is the ultimate Captain American Negro. Here are the words of Mitty Marlena Gordon. Now, for those who do not know who Mitty Marlena Gordon is, Mitty Marlena Gordon was a founder of the Pacific, of the peace movement of Ethiopia. At the time, the peace movement of Ethiopia, this was this is in the 1930s. Now, this is in the 1930s. The peace movement of Ethiopia was the largest black nationalist movement in the 1930s in the Great Depression. It was estimated that at least 400,000 signatures of black people wanted to go back to Liberia were signed. The PME had chapters all across America. Its headquarters were in Chicago, but you had people as far south as Mississippi. You had people in Arkansas. You had people in Alabama. You had people in Indiana. You had people from the surrounding states that were members of the peace movement of Ethiopia. And Minty Lena Gordon was the head of it. And here's what she wrote in the 1930s. Hungry, cold, and miserable. The pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness in America appears futile. Given an opportunity in our ancestral Africa, the knowledge of farming and of simple farm machinery implements, which we have acquired here, would enable us to carve a frugal but decent livelihood out of the virgin soil and favorable climate of Liberia. She also wrote, our condition is growing worse each day and our only hope is to go back to our own country, Africa. We want to go to this part of Africa Liberia. This is Mitty Ma Lena Gordon's own words. We want to go back to Liberia. It was her. It was Garvey the decade earlier because Mitty Ma Lena Gordon was part of the UNIA. It was Henrietta Benton Davis. It was Mammy Damina. It is Amy Astra Garvey. Here's a poem from Robert McCow. Uh, sorry, from not Robert, Albert McCow. It says, Liberia, Liberia, here we come. Sound the bungles and sound the drums. We are coming to build up a government. We will build up a government they have there because there is nothing but troublemakers on every hand. You are the men and women that Liberia needs and we'll make an army of men like you. I am sure all of you have agreed to go back to Liberia to live where you won't have to be lynched or killed. This is the poem from Albert McCall. Or McCall, my bad, Albert McCall. Um, talking about going to Liberia. You have Mamie Demina that gives a, a speech in Harlem saying that we need to go and build Liberia. You have the African Reconstruction Association that's here. You have the Pacific Movement of the Eastern World, also known as PMU or the PMEW. Okay. This is what's going on from the time Liberia has gained its independence. Now we're in the 1930s. We're in the 1930s. Okay, now, Garvey has centered his movement on this. They went to Liberia. They've been rejected. Henrietta Benton Davis and all of them went there. 
But people forget about that. And I'm going to delve into that once I understand the importance of what Liberia inspired. I'm going to talk about what Liberia went through. Okay. But this is what Liberia is going on. Okay, now we're in the 1930s. Okay. Amy Ashford Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, she's going to go to Liberia and she's going to try to become a Liberian citizen. And here's what she wrote to William V.S. Tubman. Because of the pride I now feel in becoming a Liberian citizen and because I know of the aims, aspirations, and hopes of millions of denationalized blacks who look with jealous pride to Liberia, I beseech or recommend, but I demand that a cultural relations department be established. This is Amy Ashford Garvey's own words. One of the greatest black female, one of the greatest black women, excuse me, one of the greatest black women authors to ever existed. Amy Ashford Garvey is on the top tier of black women up there. She is on, she is a creme de la creme black woman. She is on that level. She was a businessman. She was a businesswoman. She was an activist. She wrote plays. She wrote poems. She did it all. And she, and this is what she's saying. She had cordial relations with William B.S. Tubman, the president of Liberia. Okay. Now, now, wow, I didn't even notice. Thank you for bringing this up. Elias Hill was attacked by the KKK viciously. It drove him to go to Liberia. And I am, I'm glad he did that for his own sanity. And that's one of the reasons why Liberia was that haven. When black people were being lynched, when black people were being attacked, Liberia was that safe haven. That's why Liberia fever was all over the place. When we were being attacked, we knew there was somewhere where we could go. We knew that we had somewhere to go. There was a place where every black person was welcome. Whether or not you were a black American, black Caribbean, continental African, Liberia was there for us. It was always there and it still is. Now let's get to continental Africans because I haven't brought up continental Africans. Here is Sekou Ture of Guinea. This is his own words. In the history of this new Africa, which has just come into the world. Liberia has a preeminent place because she has been, for each of our peoples, the living proof that our liberty was possible. And nobody can ignore the fact that the star which marks the Liberian national emblem has been hanging for more than a century, the sole star that illuminated our night of dominated peoples. This is Sekou Ture of Guinea, one of the most revolutionary leaders who said we would rather be in poverty than us being subjugated to the French at a time when the French, when they left Guinea, burned government buildings, burned schools, killed livestock, destroyed tracks, uh, uh, train tracks, destroyed hospitals, left the people with nothing, flooded the country with a counterfeit currency so that they could create inflation. This was the level of brutality inflicted upon the Guinean people. And let's not forget, certain sections of Guinea were part of Liberia. That's why today, in some parts of Guinea, Liberian ethnic groups are known as French Pele, French this, French that, because they were part of the same people, but got carved up 
and got lines drawn by the French. And they were separated from their Liberian brethren. But this is just Sekou Terrain. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Kwame Ture, uh, not, not we have Kwame Ture to certain, a certain extent. We have Kwame Ture, we have Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, who people consider in the pantheon of Pan-Africanism. He himself quoted Liberia and said, I judge Liberia not where the heights it has reached, but where it has came from. This is Kwame Nkrumah. He went to Liberia in 1951, six years before Ghana would gain its independence. He would quote Liberia as an inspiration to his people. Kwame, uh, Kwame Nkrumah would have a conference that would lead to the Organization of African Unity in Liberia, Sanaquelli, Liberia. It was known as the Tubman Nkrumah Ture Conference in 1959. It led to what was called, it was called, and I kid you not, they wanted to create a community of independent African states. They wanted a united Africa. They wanted all African, all places on the African continent to be decolonized. And it was held in Liberia. Two years later, you have what's called the Committee of Nine. The Committee of Nine, ladies and gentlemen, was started by a Liberian, Robert Horton. He got nine countries, nine nations to come together and create the Monrovia Group and also the African Development Bank. This was in 1961, and this was in Monrovia. We created the Monrovia Group. It led to the Organization of African Unity, which today we call the African Union. We were one of the founding members of ECOWAS. We created the union of the Mono River that now includes Guinea and Ivory Coast. We were founders of the we were one of the we, yeah, we were founders of the United Nations. We were part of the League of Nations. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Nandi Azikawe of Nigeria also lived in Liberia. Africans from others referred to Liberia as Little America due to her progress and level of development. Let's go even further. The first African students to come to an HBCU were from Liberia. Did you know that? Lincoln University. Matter of fact, I have link, an archive from Lincoln University, 1881, of the Africans who were from Liberia. And it was Lincoln University. Let me see if I can Lincoln University. Yes, the 1881 catalog of Lincoln University. Okay. I'm going to. Yes, here's one right here. Right here. I'm about to show you guys right here. The first HBCU in America. Bought Liberians. Here they were. So people understand just how important Liberia was. Here it is, y'all. 
the 1880-1881 catalog. Let me let me let me let me get that up for you guys more. This is the 1881 catalog. Okay, this is the 1881 catalog. Okay. I want you guys to look at let me see let me let me zoom in. Let me zoom in so y'all can see the names. Can y'all see the names? Hold on. Can y'all see the names or do I need to zoom in more? Um if you can't let me know and um I will uh try to see if I can zoom in more. Um if not, I will just zoom in really close and then we'll just do that. Um so here it is. 1880 to 1881. Okay. Look at the names. Oh my God. My bad. Hold on. My bad. Um, look at the names. So people fully understand how influential Liberia was. Um, here. My bad, y'all. Look at it. You have Liberia. You also have somebody from Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica. This is from Lincoln University, senior class, Kingston, Jamaica. You have Alonzo Miller, Marshall, Liberia. You have Thomas H. Roberts, Monrovia, Liberia. You have Samuel S. Sevier, Marshall, Liberia. You have James W. Wilson, Cape Mount, Liberia. Calvin R. Wright, Marshall, Liberia. Robert F. Deputy, Marshall, Liberia. Robert D. King, Marshall, Liberia. I think that is all of the Liberians. In the 1880-1881 catalog of Lincoln University. So if you understand why I have so much love for Liberia and you wonder why I defend Liberia, the way that I do is we have allowed as African-Americans, especially our country, to be tainted, demonized, and we have not fought back. Okay? We have allowed white historians to describe Liberia's story. We have people who said that ACS is the reason why Liberia existed. Even though we have countless evidence to show that Paul Cuffey was what inspired the ACS. Paul Cuffey would send 38 African Americans to Sierra Leone. He doesn't do that. The ACS, the ACS might have developed, but it wouldn't have been remotely as successful. Paul Cuffey did it himself years before the ACS did it. As a matter of fact, when Paul Cuffey said, we should go back to Africa, black leaders were with it. There may have been opposition to the ACS, but I need people to understand this. Opposition to the ACS does not mean opposition to us repatriating back to Africa. Absalon Jones, John, Cla uh, John Gloucester. You have James Fortin. All of them supported repatriation to Africa. They may not have said it out loud, but they did, and they supported what Cuffey did. We can go back even further. We have Thomas Peters. We have Harry Washington that go to Liberia. 
You have Jamaican Maroons that go to um, I mean, to Sierra Leone, not, not Liberia. Liberia's not there at the time. Sierra Leone, Freetown at the time. You have Jamaican Maroons that are fleeing to Sierra Leone. Okay? You got even Prince Hall advocating for that in the 1780s. He's the first Black Freemason. You have Black people in Providence, Rhode Island, asking can they be sent back to Africa in 1788? We have always wanted to be go back home. One of the central messages of African American history and liberation is the return back to the African continent. There has been a back to Africa movement ever since Black Americans stepped foot here. There was a Back to Africa movement as far back reported in the Negro in the Journal of Negro History as 1714. When the colonies were being developed, you had a Back to Africa movement or people trying to go back to the continent of Africa. You have it in the 1770s. You have it in the 1780s with, with, with Thomas Peters in Freetown. You have it in the 1810s. You have it in the 1820s. You have it in the 1850s, the 1880s. You have it in, in, in the 1890s a little bit. You have it in the 1920s. You have it in the 1950s and 1960s. And now we're having our Back to Africa movement in the 2010s and 2020s. We have always wanted to go home and return back to the continent. And we did it. And we made something out of it. Whenever you as a Black American see a Liberian flag, stick your head up high. I wave that Liberian flag with the utmost pride. Okay? I wave that Liberian flag with the utmost pride. Okay? I did not get this flag because it doesn't mean anything. I got this flag because it means something to me. It means something to me. The women who sewn this together who made patriotic speeches, the Susanna Lewis's of the world, the Sarah Drapers, the Mary Hunters, the Colinette Teague, the sister of Hillary Teague. You have Rachel Johnson. You have Matilda Spencer. All of these people who made the Liberian flag ours. Okay, Liberia is the colonization of Pan-Africanism. Even to understand, even Ben Ami, who was a Hebrew Israelite, and I do not support the Hebrew Israelite movement at all, before his people went to Israel, they made a pit stop in Liberia. They even said, quote, Liberia was the land where we could cleanse our soul. Before they made their way to Israel. It's even speculated that they were supposed to have stayed in Liberia. That their intention wasn't to go to Israel. You have Nina Simone when she goes to Liberia. It was advised by Miriam Makiba, a black South African. Mama Africa, she said, Liberia is the perfect place for an African-American to gain their African heritage. These are her own words of Miriam Makiba. Nina Simone would stay in Liberia. She did Liberian Calypso. She's not the only one. You had Maya Angelou 
that was briefly there. Malcolm X goes to Liberia. Martin Luther King goes to Liberia. And we have forgotten our responsibility, our duty. Like we were the first ones to build a five-star hotel in Africa. Exactly. Mm-hmm. If you can, yep, if you can kill people, but you can't kill ideas, was a country. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the things is Liberia is still there. Liberia is still there. We dream, we have people today who dream saying we should rebuild Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street doesn't exist anymore. But Liberia does. I can go find Liberia. Mm-hmm. Yep. Booker T. Washington started at his technical school in, 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 uh, in Liberia. He helped design um, the president's mansion in Liberia. Garvey sent his UNIA there as well, and many of his people went there. We have so much. And understand, and this is what I want to, to emphasize. Liberia, Black America will succeed when Liberia succeeds. If Liberia doesn't succeed, Black America can never succeed. Let me tell you why. Before the Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Tuskegee um, experiment happened, do you not know they were testing malaria on Liberia? Mm -hmm. Before, before Tuskegee happened, America had done experiments on Liberia. injecting malaria into them, doing medical experiments. They were they had segregated hospital schools in those Firestones area. Displacing Liberians. The reality of the situation is we cannot be free if Liberia ain't free. Because this is something else that people forget. What is one of the biggest reasons why people say black Americans shouldn't go back to Africa? What do they always bring up? Liberia. That's why. They keep bringing up Liberia. As to why we shouldn't go back home. If Liberia succeeds and prospers, we put everybody to sleep. There's no more criticisms. But until Liberia is up and running, it ain't going to happen. It will not happen. We can keep daydreaming. We can keep hoping that things are going to change. It's not. Because how can we say we have pride and yet we've abandoned the country that we had connections with for over 150 years, really 175 years. How can we say to the world we have pride and we've just abandoned the country that we helped establish? I'll never forget one of the great Pan-African historians said to me, he said, it is a great shame that black Americans abandoned Liberia. It is a great shame that black Americans abandoned Liberia. And it is. We should have been, we should have been Liberia every ever since 1980 happened. We should have been involved in every in everything. And we didn't. We just said, 
hey, you know, that, that country over there, yeah, it, you know, it was founded by us. It had a huge inspiration, but, I mean, what, what, what what's special about it, right? Mm-hmm. Liberia is the Black Wall Street that never dies. I'll never forget that. Mm-hmm. The Booker T. Washington Institute is still in, in um, is it Kakata? Uh, I think it's Kakata. I, I said Kakata wrong, but it's wrong. It's Kakata. Uh, Liberia. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. And it's a STEM institute. Black Wall Street can't be without Liberia. It's like Chinatown without China. Yeah. And also, let me add this. And if you want to come in, let me know and I'll put the link in. I will put the link in the chat if you want to come in and if you want to say a piece. But this also has to be stated. You can't, if black Americans. Oh, no, my bad, y'all. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me. Yes. Yes. I don't blame what Bob Johnson said. I mean, we should not be looking at Liberia like it's something to run away from. We should be looking at Liberia as a place to to be free, as a place to be ourselves. Because guess what? Liberia has everything that we need. It has the African-American culture, but it also has the Afro-Caribbean culture. It has the African culture. We have three scripts that we can be proud of. We have the Bi script. We have the Loma syllabary. We have the Pele syllabary. We have the Mende syllabary. We have so much that Liberia has created. We have so much to be proud of. You have the Name Mood Institute. The Name the name um, Institute is it's the Democratic for uh, Democratic Development. That's what name our partners for democratic development. They even said during the bicentennial that the Liberian government needs to give incentives for black Americans to come to Liberia. And we can make that possible. We are two. We were there since 1822 and we've been independent since 1847. There's no way Liberia should not be a first world country right now. Liberia should be the envy of the world. Liberia should be the equivalent of Denmark, Sweden, Singapore, Dubai. It should be black Mecca up in there. All the major black businesses should be in Monrovia. All black suburbs, black suburban life should be in Bensonville and Crozierville and in Bomi. And in Margibi and the, Monrovia should be New York. Buchanan should be the equivalent of like, we could say Chicago or, yeah, yeah Chicago. You should, uh, Harper should be like Maryland. Since it's Maryland County, it should be Maryland. Peace, my sister. How are you doing? Hello. Sorry about that. I had it on mute. You are good. So, Jabari, 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 you said something that I was just going to listen, but you said something that triggered me. And when you said African-Americans should not have abandoned Liberia, it triggered me. So I called to tell you um, that was painful to hear. Um, that isn't exactly what happened, and I've never really looked at it that way. Um, but what really happened was that Africa as a whole, including the Africans in Liberia, all of the uh black intellectuals um abandoned abandoned Liberia when 1980 happened, everybody cowered. This the, the 1980 coup was not a mass uprising. And even after the coup, they asked Doe, you know, what new policies are you going to put in place? And he said, no new policies. We're going to continue the same policies. He didn't even know what he was doing. This was not a mass uprising like, you know, the revisionists like to make it look like it was. Um, 
all of the educated and prepared Liberians of all backgrounds abandoned the country between 1980 and 1990 as it slowly deteriorated. And I'm talking about the people who were living there. What breaks my heart to hear you say African Americans abandoned Liberia is I remember being a child and when the Civil War happened and, uh, you know, I was a student activist and we were protesting in front of the Minnesota State Capitol because that was my access. I couldn't go to D.C. So we're harassing, you know, the late uh, Paul Wellstone, the late Senator Paul Wellstone. We're, you know, saying, damn it, you guys have to do something. You guys have to do something. There was a Congressional Black Caucus. There were Black people in a position to say something and do something. Some of the most powerful people in the world at that time were African American. I remember because in the minds of people like uh, um, Bill Clinton, Somalia and Liberia are the same. So because they had that whole Black Hawk Down incident, the U.S. uh, population was really against somebody intervening in the Liberian Civil War because of what happened in Somalia, because as far as they're concerned, it's all the same darkies on the dark continent, it doesn't make any difference. I remember being a young adult, a young person, and listening to these people say, you know, not one U.S. life is worth all of the lives in Liberia, not one American life. I remember Liberian Americans who were in the military volunteering Um, like Solomon Vincent and and others volunteering to go back to Liberia and intervene. And they said, you you can't do that. Obviously, you can't deploy yourself. But that kind of um, statement about abandonment, I don't know if that's what we want to call it. But um, the most powerful people in the world said nothing for a very, very long time and allowed the situation to deteriorate, allowed our libraries, our museums, our history to be looted and destroyed. We lost so much of our historic memory in that war. Not only human life, which was the most tragic part, and infrastructure, which is also tragic, but something that is even you know, more lasting and more difficult for the reparations of our country. When I say reparations, I mean to repair the country and put things back together, is the loss of actual history. Mm-hmm. There were targets. The museum in, in Harper was targeted and burned. I don't think that was an accident. They looted everything in Liberia. I remember Dr. Dunn and those guys in the height of the war got on a plane, went to Ivory Coast, had to take an even smaller, dangerous plane to go to Monrovia to try to save documents in the archives and barely were able to get anything together. The Tubman papers were rescued, but so much more was lost. So there's there's things that Liberia refused to allow ACS to take out of the country that somehow left the country or were burned, we don't know. So this whole thing about abandonment, I just wanted to be a little bit careful. It triggered me only because I don't, I don't really believe um, that it was, it, was, it was like an intentional, I think it was you know, the, just a misinformation campaign and people not being taught anything. What you're doing is powerful. I absolutely love you, my brother, and I, I hope you continue um, to speak with the passion you do, but um, let's not use the word abandonment. That's completely triggered me. <laughs> Well, All right. well, to be honest, Ka, um, mm-hmm. uh, good to talk to you. I've talked to you another another time when you're on uh, Focus on Liberia. I like that okay. you guys are collaborating, you and Jabari. Um, but how can you not say it's abandonment when back in like the 20s, Booker T, Washington, WB, uh, WB the Voice were like pressuring the United States to intervene and trying to, uh, I, it was something with the debt that Liberia had where they went in and they were part of the receivership program that uh that was going on but it was like black leaders were going over there and, and had a stake in the country they were like going over there and pressing the u.s to do things over there and there's nobody like you be hard <laughs> pressed for anybody in the congressional black caucus to tell you where liberia is on the map mm-hmm. well so- i mean I, I would say this i would say sorry to interrupt i would say just to respond to that keith ellison who i i grew up i literally grew up you know he's, he's, he's a big brother to me um, he was in law school when I was like a senior in high school and we were all part of the same, you know, student activist group. Um, but Keith Ellison, when he was in Congress and I was working in Liberia, he went to Liberia regularly. Keith Ellison went to Liberia regularly. And, you know, so 
everyone didn't abandon Liberia, but this is, of course, after the war. During the war, Keith was still a student. He was still young. Mm, yeah. So um, it really is. Uh, the reason I don't like the word abandonment, I think, you know, Jabari laid it out very well. There has been a disinformation campaign. It has been calculated. It has been repeated. It has been on blast. And it is the, the, the overwhelming consciousness of all Black people, whether they be African, yeah. African-American, Caribbean, it, Latin Blacks, the whole, whole world, people in, the, in Europe. There's probably a Black man sitting on a, 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 a planet in outer space somewhere. All they know is that's the country where black people committed apartheid against other black people. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's all I don't, people know. The, the reason, the reason that's why the word abandonment triggers me because if you don't know something, it's like having a parent you don't know about or a child you don't know about. Is that abandonment if you don't know the person exists? That's true. I get what you're saying. I, I get what you understand saying. what I'm saying? So yeah. this is why it's important. This is why information is important. This is why. You know, it's it's our responsibility to reverse the brainwashing. And it is not only African-Americans. That's why I said every community, I mean, Liberians themselves have been so brainwashed against themselves. That's why the country looks the way it does. Mm -hmm. They systematically dismantled education in the country to make sure that the, the every generation that it produces is going to be as ignorant as possible. I mean, it's really. It's funny deep. you say that because it's the same thing going on in Black America, where they don't, we're not teaching our history and passing our history down to anybody. And so now I'm, I, I met a girl that said Martin Luther King was a clone. I'm like, how Martin Luther King? What are you talking about? Or they say, <laughs> we yeah, only had the opportunity we had today because of Martin Luther King. Yeah, they learned their history in little, you know, five minute in, in like memes. They don't even watch. I wouldn't. Even, I was gonna say five minute videos, but they don't even watch videos. They don't even have that attention span. It's these stupid memes, and that's that's it. And TikTok young people is gonna be the end of Western civilization. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this: that uh, watching focus on Liberia, because I um, I went to the Liberian Business Expo. That was really cool. I met some people. I got invited to the United Basa Organization in the Americas. Um, okay. You know the the cassava leaf, the tabugi. Oh, uh, okay. I always I always pronounce it wrong. But it was hot, no, though, but it was good. Mm-hmm. And, um, but yeah, but I, but linking up with them and doing different stuff with them, it was, like, really cool. And then it just kind of made me kind of think, like, dang, like, we're, like, let me just see what, what's going on. Because I know we got to have black organizations that are kind of, like, you know, not necessarily doing stuff in Liberia, but just doing stuff for ourselves. Because Liberians are organized. It seems like every Liberian is a preacher and a lawyer and like, like if you were gonna stereotype a Liberian, everybody knows the law. Everybody knows what what, what do you call those minutes that people do when they're like, you know, the the meeting is coming to order. And they the the um. But it's, when I was at that organization, everybody was on it. Everybody was on it. That man is out of order. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows protocol and all that kind of stuff. We got a whole yeah. history of that. Yeah, but, but Kyle, can you tell me what happened? Where are the American Liberians today? Because every Liberian I meet is mixed. I met crew mixed with Basa. I met Basa. I met Loma mixed with Grebos. But I have not met any Amer- American Liberians. And all the ones that you see, like Charles Taylor, Sterling Johnson, early, they're mixed with something else. So, are there oh, any American Liberians Sule- left? Uh, yeah, Ellen Johnson Sulev is an American Liberian at all. You got absolutely no ancestors um, yeah, she's that German. are African American. Her 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 grand I mean her um her her grandmother was a crew woman and her grandfather was German. That's why she's 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 light skinned. Yeah. And so she's got German ancestry, but everyone else is indigenous. The Johnson name that she carries was the name of a paramount chief. In, in Gola country. So her she's mostly okay. Gola. You know, her father's Gola and her mother is crew and, and with a German father, um, a, a absent German father at that. So culturally, uh, even her, her grandmother, um, I mean, culturally, her mother is, is crew, not German. So she's, okay. she's, she's not, yeah. So that, and Charles Taylor is mostly indigenous. He has one yeah. out of... Um, He's got one out of eight great grandparents who are who who was a miracle Liberian. 
or African American. I don't like the term American Liberian. So he's yeah. got so one out of people eight. still exist. Yeah. So what they do, of course, right? So you have. I don't believe, you know, from my studies, I, I love genealogy. I love it so much. But there was so much intermixing. Most people who consider themselves American Liberian or Congo, as we generically call Liberians, generically call um, people who uh, repatriated to Liberia, are a mixture of many different backgrounds. And all of them have indigenous heritage, with the exception of those who just recently went to, the, to Liberia, like maybe if you you know, count people who migrated there in the 60s and 50s, which um, you've got, okay. you've got a few, you know, people who recently migrated. And of course, like uh, um, Dr. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name right now, but but anyway, he wouldn't have married a Basa woman. So his children are all half Basa anyway. So <laughs> okay. you've got, yeah. So people, they just go and they, they, it is truly a it truly is a pan African country. That's why when people talk about apartheid, I'm like, it's so stupid. There has never been any laws or regulations keeping people apart in Liberia. That's the stupidest thing. Everybody went to the same schools. There was no laws or rules banning anyone from going to school because you were this. That's apartheid was literally a system of laws that kept people apart. And on paper, in their laws, black people were written as inferior. I remember being a teenager and going to the South African consulate in Chicago because um, we were going to go register uh, people in the townships to vote. So we drove from Minneapolis to Chicago. I used to hang out with a bunch of older college kids when I was young. We drove to Chicago and uh, Brock Satter was, was driving. We got his, I don't know, know you guys remember those little Geo Metros? It was wintertime when this tiny little car drove <laughs> yeah. to Chicago and uh they were all, you know, college students also in high school, but we, we got to the council and it was this little waiting room with a, like a, a thick glass window that the South African officials were sitting behind. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Got there and I'm like, wow, they're sitting behind bulletproof glass. And we had to sit at the coffee table and gave them our passports for them to give us the um, visa stamp. We had to wait right there. It wasn't something like it was done pretty quickly. It took like an hour or whatever, but we sat there while we're sitting there for about an hour, hour, 10 minutes. There's these uh, books on the coffee table. So I took one of the books. I start looking through it and it had these diagrams of heads of people. It had the European head. I mean, I'm telling you something that happened in my lifetime in the 90s. There's a European head. There's a Bushman's head and, you know, a, a, a Bantu head. And there, the, it was basically supposed to be some kind of anthropological magazine about South Africa and how it went down of, of the inferiority of the Bushmen to the Bantu and to blah, blah, blah. And here it has, you know, the European, you know, as the pinnacle of, of humankind in a freaking coffee table, you know, on a, on a coffee table in a book, in a consulate for a country that had just overthrown apartheid and was just getting ready to get people registered to vote. They still had this freaking book on the coffee table. And if you ever wonder why South Africans are so hateful towards other Africans and are quick to burn them alive and do all the stuff they do, this is social conditioning. This is the product of Bantu education. They're being told that these people are animals. They themselves are animals. You know, and this is this is the reason you see 1980 coup was so was was possible. This is why all this stuff is possible. The war that they wage, the psychological war that they wage on African people is just unprecedented in human history. You can talk about, you know, you can talk about Genghis Khan and his massacres across Asia, but he never dehumanized human beings. No group of human beings has been dehumanized like African people. And until we can humanize ourselves, our conditions globally will not change. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. that's how deep it is. I mean, they, they, grain that, they ingrain that into people. And so the, the young Africans in South Africa, in Liberia, everywhere, this is how they're trained, this is how they're educated, this is how they're made to think. The only population of African people that is, has not been subject to this just because of sheer resilience are African Americans. 
And that is something I'm saying, not because I was, you know, I, I grew up in America, but because I've traveled a lot. I've been to a lot of places. I've been all over the Caribbean. I've been all over Africa. I know what I'm saying. And we like to say, oh, well, you know, the what time it is. And we have to start, we have to recognize that as Africans, I mean, as a Liberian, um, we have to start to recognize that. And we need to have that, that information exchange. We need to have that um, process of, of, of knowledge transfer, extremely mm -hmm. important. So I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox. But I just wanted to throw that out. Oh, no, there. no, no. Keep talking. <laughs> I'm going to say these are words of wisdom because everything you're saying is, is so important. And, you know, to understand mental brainwashing, right, is, is look at how when they talk about Liberia and it's specifically coming from other Africans, like so, so I'll give an example, Nigerians, right? They'll say, oh, Liberia was this and it was that. And, and it was like you said, this committed apartheid. And one of the questions I always said was, if it was apartheid, why didn't the black South Africans who went to Liberia said it was apartheid? Because I'm pretty sure that those black South Africans like Mary McKeeba and Nelson Mandela who went to Liberia, stayed there and taught at university would kind of know if it was apartheid if it was there. That's number one. And then number two is, is Nandi Azikawe, the first president of Nigeria, described Liberia as the nucleus of black hegemony, the soil where the seed of African civilization was determined to germinate. This is the first president of Nigeria speaking, what we call the giant of Africa. And so it's like, that's what happens when you've been brainwashed. As Malcolm X described, exactly. the media and the brainwashing will have you hate the oppressed, but love the oppressor. You will hate exactly. You, you will hate us, but you will gladly Nigeria. There are some Nigerians, not all. There are some Nigerians that will bash Liberia, but will instantly say it. I kid you not. I saw it on social media where they said that white people are superior to black people. I kid you not. But don't them be the main ones, right? That's what we say. <laughs> Those be yeah. the ones. You know the 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 the, the indigenous Liberians. You know, people from my my ethnic background and other indigenous Liberian ethnic backgrounds who are most vocally and militantly anti-Liberian are these same people that were, you know, are Bible something Trump supporters. It's not an accident. You have a whole period from about 1900 to present where majority of the schools and the missionaries and the preachers were coming from the Jim Crow South. We're coming from the racist confed post-Confederate South. Going to Liberia, what the hell was their interest in Liberia? To thwart black liberation. Setting up these schools, this stuff is not an accident. Going in there with their pictures of lily white Jesus and telling little African boys and girls that your whole history is demonic. We've come to save you. Your ancestors are demons. You know, bitter cola was a symbol of peace. You can't, you can't, Christians don't eat cola. Red oil is our butter. Christians don't eat red oil. So they couldn't stop them from completely eating it. Right now in Liberia, most people don't eat red oil on Sunday. Christians don't do this. Christians don't do that. You know, Christians don't have these devil bush names like Ka and Nimpu and <laughs> Swa. You have to call yourself Mary and Joseph. And don't forget, put a bra on. You understand? So this is how this is what was going on. This is what was going on. And, and, and it wasn't only indigenous people being taught like this. The descendants of the repatriated African Americans are also being educated because they all went to the same schools. So they're being miseducated. So they're trying to buck break them psychologically so that they don't behave like Hillary T and Elijah Johnson. So you end up with CTO King who was born a, yeah. a recaptured African rescued from a slave ship as a very young child, born in literally in captivity. CTO King's ancestors never left the African shores. They were rescued from a slave ship. 
off the coast of West Africa and brought to Sierra Leone. T.T.O. King was one of the most brilliant men to ever, you know, walk the earth. This guy was amazing. He has a son. He sends his son to these schools. His son ends up being one of the greatest coons in our history because of diseducation, miseducation. And that's so it wasn't just the, the people in the, 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 you know, the, these little forest towns that are being brainwashed. They're also brainwashing the children of the elites, the children of the founders. They're all being fed the same stupidness. So now you have, after the turn of the century, now in the 20th century, you have a generation of people who are half Pella, half Basa, whatever. They are now denouncing, denouncing their indigenous heritage, and pushing their noses in the air at other Africans. Well, I am not going to allow these savages to marry my children. I'm from up St. Paul River. I am from Harper. You know, and they know damn well their grandmama is grable. But, but didn't a lot they, of the, they, the, the big, like the, the founders and the, the rich men in Liberia, didn't they all have country wives too? So wouldn't they have mixed descendants anyway? That's, that's what I'm saying. They, these people know their grandparents. I'm talking about the 20th, early 20th century now, right? So they know their okay. grandparents are indigenous. They know, but they denounce that. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, some of the most, some of the most powerful uh, um, American Liberians, most prominent, I want to use the word power, power is not the correct word. Some of the most prominent high society, social like American Liberians, so-called American Liberians, I don't like the term, but that's what people understand. In Liberia, like Clavinda Parker, she's a Vi woman. She's mostly Vi. Most of these people that everyone's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. They've got one, one ancestor, one ancestor way back that came from somewhere. You know, um, J.J. Dolson was a full-blooded indigenous Liberian. He was vice president to Arthur Barkley. Militantly, UNIA, he came to the United States, made a speech, and said, Hey, we want 600,000 African Americans to come back to Liberia. This is an indigenous man. He ended, he ended up being chief justice of Liberia. Nobody talks about him. Mm -hmm. The narrative is, Oh, no, it was apartheid. Tell me what African, you know, apartheid system was the chief justice for the country. Tell me what African under apartheid South Africa was vice president for the country. This is 1904. They don't talk about J.J. Dosen. They just mention him. He's a footnote. Nobody cares. They just assume his parents or grandparents came on one ship. They did not. But everywhere you look, there's these signs of, of, of not only, it's not even assimilation of, of, of cooperation and collaboration and intermarriage. It was dangerous. Then the other false narrative they preach about Liberia, which is disturbing as hell, because they were successfully able to do it to some extent in the United States, which is this light skin, dark skin divide. Mm -hmm. They try to push this old color narrative. Mm -hmm. It's a lie. It's a yeah. lie. Because every light skin Liberian, when I go back and study their, their genealogy and their descendants, with the exception of J.J. Roberts, who had his wife imposed upon him, his second wife, um, they either married indigenous women or they married dark-skinned Congos, which are recaptured Africans, or they married dark-skinned African-Americans. I challenge people to show me one prominent, all the Dunbars and the, um, the uh, uh, Yuris and all of these people who went to Liberia as mulattoes. Show me the people that they married in Liberia. Most of the, the numbers women. just don't add up. There's no way there's that many light skinned people in Liberia and they can just make it, it so. wasn't. And you hear mm -hmm. them talking, they're like, oh, it was the light, it was a light skinned hegemony. I mean, that's the narrative, and there's zero evidence of it. I mean, look at and when we talked about it, look at how they portrayed James Briggs Payne. I thought James Briggs Payne was literally an octoroon until um Carl found a uh, found a picture of him in 1868 when he was alive, and I'm like, nah. He can't be that dark skin. He can't be <laughs> darker than me 
black, and he was. And I, every one of these Liberian presidents was black, with the exception of Roberts and Russell. And Russell wasn't even one sixteenth black. We did his genealogy, and he was a quarter black at <laughs> at the minimum. And his and his grandmother was born in Africa. His grandmother was purchased off a slave ship. That's that's his mother's mother was purchased off a slave ship. He was one of the most militantly anti-European presidents Liberia ever had. Mm -hmm. You know, he was he was he was he was he would have put. Uh, um, I mean, he was one of the most militant, pro-African, self-determination, economic freedom. You know, we can do this ourselves, African presidents ever. You can compare him to, you can compare this man to Patrice Lumumba. You can compare this man to many who came generations after him. Go back and look at what Russell used to say and look at what, uh, 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 what's his name in Burkina Faso used to say, uh, uh, Thomas Sankara. Mm -hmm. He's up there with those fellas. Yep, and and I want. They're up there with him. He's the ancestor. They're up there with him. I think this is a man was, you know that died in the eighteen hundred. These are these are the trailblazers of African thought. Yep, I was about to say again. You you have Edward Wilmot Blyden, who inspired people like Garvey, inspired people like Nkrumah, sparked all these Pan Africanist leaders. Who did his? Who was? Edward Wilmot Blyden's mentor. Hillary T. Blyden, Blyden, Blyden was, was, was inspired by Elijah Johnson. And Hillary and, he, yeah. and, and, and Citizen Teague, right? So, and you have to remember, Blyden had more access to their writings than we do because much of the things that, that these guys wrote have been lost. Yep. Mm. So Same one of the things you have to remember, Hillary Teague was a prolific writer. What happened to all of the things that he wrote? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Biden was, was alive the at the war. time. I'm no, some of that stuff was taken out of the country by the ACS. And one yeah. thing I know is European pretend, That's the yeah, they thing. pretend. Exactly. They pretend to destroy documents, but you know what they really do? They keep them in their archives. Mm hmm. So th that's a different discussion for another day. But maybe they're destroyed. So maybe they just some, keep them some in the museum like, in London know. has it in the back room somewhere. Yeah, I'm saying Library of Congress in the United States. Oh, yep. Okay. I mean, uh, blue. I mean, to understand the point, right? Me and me and her ha and, and and a few and a few others are trying as hard as we can to identify the portraits of the Liberian people taken. We have done our part in trying to identify some, but there are still some. That we haven't identified that the Library of Congress knows who they are. Okay. Of course they do. Of course they do. And I, I was able to I was able to piece together now we have all of the presidents. We don't need sketches anymore. They were all photographed. So there's no more mystery about the, these mysterious mulatto presidents that didn't exist. If you can Daniel have a Bashir picture Warner of JJ Roberts, full, there should be pictures of everybody. Daniel Bashir Daniel Bashir exactly. Daniel Bashir Warner was repeatedly described as a full-blooded African, full-blooded Negro by some. And they had him looking like he was, you know, some kind of, you know, octroon or mulatto, not really octroon, but they made him at least look like he was mulatto, right? And I was like, you know, what was he, like a red Ebo? Like, why was he so red? But then I found his photo, and I'm like, what the hell? This brother looked like he was straight out of, um, you know, Yoruba land or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. they do the same thing here. They lighten up Martin Luther King to the point where, you know, he looked like his dad might have been Irish or something. I've seen some super light pictures of Martin Luther King where, you know, all these black yeah, people, they got to lighten them up a little bit. Yeah, we got video of him. They can't really play that game with Dr. King, you know, photographs of him and stuff, it, you know, but for, for Daniel Bashir Warner, I mean, they, they what they did to these Liberian presidents, especially the first five, what they did to these people was akin to what they did to the pharaohs of Egypt. Like, let's whiten them. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, it was like, because they, it was so long ago, and these people, and, and then they took their photographs out of the country. 
Yeah. Because at that time, these pictures were done on these steel plates, right? Because steel and copper plates and the Library of Congress has them. Why? Because mm -hmm. Augustus Washington, who took the photos, who left America because he wasn't a citizen, they told him he wasn't, you know, told black people, you're not citizens. 1865, you're not citizens, right? So everybody goes, you know, finds a place to go. He wanted to settle in Haiti. He decided to go to Liberia. They had no right to remove his work from Liberia, but they did. Keeping at the Library of Congress, they tell us what they want to tell us. They put in mm -hmm. exhibits what they want to put in exhibits, but they have mm -hmm. way more information than they're showing people. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and to understand how the, the sabotage has been, and, and, and this is where I really wanted to go into um, what Liberia went through and why we need to stick our heads up high. Um, we talked about this earlier, but um, I, for people who do not know, if it wasn't for those leaders that we had, those pioneering leaders, Liberia would not exist today. It wouldn't exist. There was a time when Liberia was supposed to have been what we consider the modern territory today of Liberia to be carved up amongst European powers. They wanted to put black people on the equivalent of what we would call a reservation. It would have been called the Liberian Reserve. And it would have just been Monrovia and a few little islands and everybody was supposed to cram into that area. And then all the rest of Liberia, Nimba, Lofa, what we consider today would have all been Ivory Coast, it would have been Sierra Leone, it would have been Guinea. They wanted to put us basically in a reservation. They referred to us as being mulattoes. They referred to us as saying, oh, our government, we're just playing around. This is just dress up. This is not a real government that should be recognized amongst the nations. So I, I want people to understand the level of sabotage that was going on with Liberia. We're talking about they wanting to put us on a reservation. We're not talking. We're not talking about them saying respect our borders. They were saying put us on a reservation unless America claimed us, and they get all the pieces territory. It would have been the yep. like a Hong Kong. It would have been a tiny little city, not that big, that everybody has to cram into, and then the British get to administer all the other parts of uh, of what we consider modern day Liberia. Which is a third of its size. You, no access. Yeah, because you only saw the land they carved off of Liberia. Uh, what they called when? Because it seemed like well, after the Berlin Conference, that's when you know Liberia went into struggle mode. It exactly. seemed like before that they were able to trade with people, and then you know, then you know they weren't able to trade with people, and then it's just this one place, you know, other than Haiti, where there's and probably Ethiopia, where there's three black people. That are actually doing their own thing, and after that, it was just I mean, like yeah. I you know that we start seeing the loans start coming down where they're giving these yeah. loans, and then they're you know dictate like it was like the IMF before the IMF of the thing. It was it was it was a definitely a precursor to the the debt slavery model, and what they did. I mean, they always economically sabotaged Liberia. So ACS wanted to to, to uh, basically use Liberia as a as a resource grab. So for ACS, yeah. all those little financial, you know, reports you see, ACS was also a money making venture. These people don't do anything if they're not if it's, if it's not making money for them. So well, I mean, America was kind of that they way, so they're not going to found a colony that's not going to function. Right. They were collecting tariffs from indigenous people when they weren't even a country. When like you hadn't even declared independence, they hadn't even asserted, you know, their liberty. ACS, these white guys were out there collecting their tariffs. So there's a guy named Bustle um, by, you know, the early 1900s. Bustle is now basically playing the role of ACS. He's the one that is in charge of customs and duties for Liberia, doing the exact same thing, um, controlling revenue intake and looting the country, even down to the taxes that are collected from Liberia. Bustle is in, Bustle is in charge. It's, it's like Russell with a B. He's in charge and he's collecting all of this stuff. He lived in the nicest, most prominent home in Liberia. To this day, that house still stands, and it's the it's the it houses the uh, BVAC and Customs Office for BVAC. So imagine that craziness. It's 2023, and that house that Bustle used to live in is still being utilized for 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 customs. Um, not the the government run custom, but the corporate um concession for customs, which is through BVAC. 
these people are have done this to Liberia from its inception. When they even went to go negotiate for a place to settle at Cape Maserato, they did not take any of the African people with them. Two white guys and a gun with a gunboat <laughs> offshore. Right. The, the, right. the original gunboat diplomacy. Right. So this is the kind of stuff, this is the kind of stuff that, well, you know, they got there, it was a mulatto slave trader um, named John S. Mill who gave them Providence Island, which used to be a slave depot, like a, a slave barracoon. That and uh, John S. Mill had stopped, it had stopped being involved in the slave trade. Great Britain had outlawed it, and so he had engaged in illegal slave trading for a while and decided not to do it any longer. That's the story he gave to them and said, hey, this is these little huts here, this is where we used to keep the slaves. You, you know, you can bring your people here. There's already, you know, dwellings here. We can clean them up. They can live there. And that's how they got Providence Island. Providence Island used to be a slave barracoon. They bring them to Providence Island in 1822. They all get sick because it was a slave barracoon. It was like measles, tuberculosis, and God knows what else. Shallow graves for dead, you know, you know, enslaved, cap, you know, enslaved people. And so it's filthy. And they need to get on the mainland because they were going to all die there, just like how Sherbro Island made them sick for the same reason. It was old mm -hmm. slave barracoons. They kept putting them in old slave barracoons. Think about this. And they would add mass casualties as a result of it because these were not healthy places. And that's how they got on the mainland because King George was also not really a king, but a slave dealer. So, yeah, you guys can come and stay here. You know, I'll give you a little patch of land over here on Bushrod Island, solid ground. It's a lot cleaner, but there's no dwellings. You guys are going to have to build houses. And that's what happened. The dwellings these people were originally on were places that they used to hold enslaved people while they were waiting for them to, to uh, for a ship to arrive to purchase them. Just let that sink in for me. You know, and I'm sure there were so many traces of those horrors there when they arrived. And we don't yeah. we don't talk about that in Liberian history, but we are going to. This is why I'm so proud of Jabari. We have to tell these stories. I'm grateful for social media, and you know, even if it's five people that listen to it, people need to need to hear the truth. These people that came to establish Liberia, they were not vultures, they were not predators, they were not colonizers, they were people going home against tremendous odds, going home to a situation that was terrible. They were going to Liberia when people were still being sold into slavery. You could sit on Dukar Hill and yeah. see slave ships off in the distance in 1822, 1823, 1824. It, 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 you know, when J.J. Roberts arrived in Liberia, I think it was 1828, his ship arrived, he was appalled at what he saw. One of the greatest things, there's a lot of things about Roberts that I didn't like. He became really dictatorial and kind of crazy at the end of his life. But he stamped out so many slave barracoons along the coast and made way for African-American settlement. All along That's the, the part coast. people leave out is the when the Ameri when the American Liberians arrived, they suppressed the slave trade going up and down the coast. Like there was a lot of Violently. stuff going on over there. And the thing that people yeah. and we talked about this and we talked about this on focus on Liberia. Well, she did a good job on it. People, people don't understand the people that were being taken. We're not just talking about just regular men and women. We're talking about young men and women. We're talking about children. At least a quarter of them were children that were being taken. So you having a people coming in where slavery is running rampant. Some even get kidnapped and are almost possibly sold away. You have children being sold away. And so, and you got wars going on as well. There are wars going on that they have to deal with. The Sla so slave raiding wars. Yeah. Slave raiding wars. Yep. But I mean, but for the most part, all those people were sovereign nations. So they're going to go to war. They're going to do whatever they want to do. There's, there's no, no one reigning over anything in that part of the world at that time when Liberia was going. Well, I mean, they were reigning over themselves, right? Yeah, they were so reigning over themselves, but if, not, if, not, if, not if the Basa and the, and the Pele go to war with each other, Monrovia can't do anything about it at that time. It just is what it is. Well, there was no there was no country yet. So when this yeah. when slave trading was going on, Liberia wasn't a country, yeah. right? So it was just a settlement. 
and all of these various colonization societies were were had land to settle on because the slave trade was suppressed. So mm-hmm. if you yeah. look at all of the settlements, if you if you go back and you look at all of the slave barracoons along the Grain Coast, and then you go back and look at the settlement of all the of the colonization societies, Mississippi in Africa, um, Maryland in Africa, you go along, you see where they, all of those places, with the exception of those people going up the St. Paul River, which was also a slave trading corridor, but that's a different story. But if you look along the coast, all of those places those people settled were old slave barracoons on the coast. They look like natural harbors, like like Greenville, Harper. They look like natural places where people will come there, you know, trade in humans and and sell off. Yep, take them off to the ship. So if you look at, if you go to Voyage's uh, database and you look at all the, the spots along the coast, then go fast forward 50 years and look at where everybody settled. It's the same thing. So, so this literally, whole thing we about, oh, the slave trade, we set up shop. <laughs> and the, 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 the people who were rescued from the slave barracoons, literally thousands of them by J.J. Roberts, were incorporated into Liberia in the same way that Congos from as far away as the Niger Delta or wherever were incorporated into Liberia. Mm -hmm. So because they were coming from all different places, many of them were young and a lot of them were also children. Um, They were taught how to speak English, baptized, given Western names, they adopted the Western culture. Their descendants probably think they came from Maryland or Virginia. I mean, once you once you're culturally assimilated into another group, you might as well be from that group, especially when they're so young. Right. Exactly. And a lot of times when people would lose children, they would adopt indigenous or Congo children that were rescued and raise them as their own because these were farmers and they needed, you know, you need children. You need children on a farm. June Moore adopted a whole bunch of Pella people, Pella children, raised them, sent them to school, educated them. They went on and got their own farms on the St. Paul River. You know, so there's a, there's this this thing about the segregation and apartheid. It's just there's just zero evidence of it. Did people get bullied and called Bush boy and all this? Of course they did. People get. I mean, people do. People, Bush people like myself get educated and call their cousins Bush people. People in their own family. Oh, I'm not going around my Bush family members. This is just how people think. It's wrong. It's 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 not very nice, but it's not apartheid. That is not apartheid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But on a brighter note, uh, I'm going <laughs> to the uh, I'm going to the HBCU rugby classic uh, in April. Uh, what does rugby look like uh, in Liberia? They got any teams? You know, is it only soccer? Like, what's going on over there as far as rugby? Like, I, I think that's gonna change. That's gonna change, that's that's gonna change Liberia. We got to get a rugby team over there. No, man, y'all keep that British stuff to the British colonies. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you trying to, if you trying to create a team, you got to create a team yourself because there ain't a rugby. Right? Team. Yeah, we like, Hey, hey, like, hey, like, hey once I touch like some money, basketball players. Liberians well, are basketball players. Well, once I touch some Liberians. money, and if you guys ever see the Lone Stars as a rugby team, you know that's me. That's me, the Lone Stars. Let me let me tell you something funny. These these uh, Caribbean people from Barbados tried to bring that rugby stuff to Liberia. Everybody looked at them like they were crazy. So <laughs> you people look at me that. crazy when I, uh, as an American that likes rugby, it's just like what? <laughs> it's like we got a league. We got Major League Rugby. What you mean? DC has a team. <laughs> Kelly has a team. San Diego. Like what do you mean? All right, bro. Good job. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on a good note, yeah, we can end this on a good note. Um, yeah, glad you guys came on and, and really gave your two cents on this. This was just an important conversation to have because it's never really talked about about the influence that Liberia had on Africa, the Caribbean, and elsewhere. And it just needs to be honest because the worst thing, the thing that angers me, is when I hear Pan Africanists regurgitate these talking points. That is when I get triggered the most is when I hear Pan-Africanists who say they care about African people and wanting those principles to come in just utterly disregard Liberia. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are just they don't have they don't have enough information. It's it's, it's just misinformation and not you. It's it's, you know, knowledge is a journey. It's It's a journey without an end. And people just have to be educated and they need to be open minded. 
and be able to then, receive information that's counter to their, con- their current paradigm if they, if they want to grow. Um, the, the crazy part is that that's the only way they're able to really destroy the idea of Liberia. It's like, the country exists, so now, you know, you don't educate people, you can tear down the legacy of the place. And really, nobody does the investigation. You know, that which I'm glad you guys are collaborating and and doing you know the work to kind of like put some respect on Liberia's name because it's like that's only, you can't say it doesn't exist. You can't say the place failed. All you can do is just tear down the legacy of the place. That's the only it way they can down, like really tear down, down Liberia. I mean, they're poisoning our water. They're poisoning our air. What's going on in Liberia as we speak? as we speak is 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 like a, the slow poisoning of a society you have all these concession companies that come in un, i mean the unit the un the us uh, uh giz which is a german aid companies all of these people have these watch groups in liberia and they don't care that our waterways are poisoned they don't care that our air is poisoned they don't care that they create conditions for the most ignorant and base members of society to rise to the highest positions of power. They don't care. That's it sounds like you describe in America accident. right now. It's mm-hmm. not an accident. It's so not the, an accident. The, the, you know? the thing that's crazy is I, I read, um, is it Front Page Africa? Um, and they have some articles in there on different things in Liberia. And there was a company, it was some lady that owned this logging company I want to say it was in Sino County, and mm-hmm. she's supposed to. Th- and so, part of the agreement with the local people was you got to, you know, build a school, dig some wells. That's it. They never they built a half of a well that doesn't function. That you know they covered up because they don't want kids falling into it. They didn't build any of the other well. They didn't build anything else. You they they see the trucks taking logs out of the out of the, you know out of the forest. And then the the lady telling them, "Oh, uh, I'm not making any money because of all the restrictions and everything. We we shut down production." And then they went and found the books, and they said, "No, this lady made thirty, you know, at least three million dollars." While she's talking about she hasn't made any money, and it's just like I mean, that, it's weird that like, there's scale, no enforcement right? mechanism for that. Yeah. I mean that's small scale. I mean they have cut down. Yeah, that is really small, but down. the corruption is that deep though. Like this one business logging, you're just cutting down trees. Taking them to a, uh, they probably out. not even taking them to a sawmill in the country. They're probably taking whole logs out of the country. That's exactly. And then the one thing that the yeah, local people exactly want, yeah, so and the, the one, and the, and the couple things the local people want, they're not even providing it, and it's just like, and then the older people want to go through the courts or whatever the you know the act, the official mechanisms are. The younger people are just like, nah, we just need to blockade the road and stop them from doing anything. Which I kind of see like, you know, the younger people are a little more active than the older people but at the same time it's like they're, they're, ignorant, they're exploiting they're ignorant. the place they yeah will, they're exploiting the place people though. who are blocking the road are the same people kids that the senators and representatives from their area that they elect are criminals and they'll come in and put you know a hundred bucks in their pocket and those same young people will be dancing for them and pushing yeah. for them you know mm-hmm. so that, that that's why they keep the society ignorant because the young people don't know better either Right, and so they that, keep electing and, and empowering stupid people. Drug dealers are being elected in Liberia. We still criminals have criminals are being elected criminal. in Liberia. Hardcore criminals are electing because these hardcore criminals will put a little bit of cash in the pockets of, of the youth leaders. It's really a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And, 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 and go ahead. I was going to say, in that way, Liberia seems like a microcosm of Black America here because you see the same thing. You know, uh, pastors, they used to be pimps or drug dealers, and now they're getting all this money. Uh, the, the youth aren't being educated. The people don't know their history. It's just like, it, it, it seems like a microcosm. Like, you just take us, put us over there, change up the names, give us, you know, ethnic I mean, names, yeah, and you they, got the they, same they thing. We got a president who says he has a master's degree, but he can't read well. He can't even. But he owns well. a lot of houses, though. He he don't need he don't need to yeah. read to buy a bunch of real estate in Liberia. <laughs> you know, and 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 he comes in there and they elect him because he's a star, right? That's like yeah. That's like electing, you know. You, you guys got Trump. That's that's what it is. It's, it's like he's like the Liberian nah. Trump. He's a celebrity, no, and because no, he got no, name recognition, not. everybody votes no, for him. No, he's not. Trump, 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 Trump was evil. He knew what he was doing. 
George Wade doesn't know what he's doing. But he don't he know, know what, what he's doing, doing, but he got people on, on his team that are sending goons out to beat up people that, that disagree with the government. Like that boy that, that they shipped down that and beat him at Liberia like, University. That. that guy, that guy, that guy's play, he played, he played on people's um, hate and he knew what he was doing. Like, yeah, I'm about to say George Weah is, is an utter failure in my personal opinion, but and, we are we are isn't out there with any agenda other than he he just believes that when you're in power you're supposed to everything belongs to him. He sincerely thinks that everything in that country belongs to him. He sincerely thinks that he can play in the budget. He doesn't know any better. He literally doesn't like know. He doesn't try to hide what he's doing. He doesn't hide what he's doing because he doesn't know any better. He thinks that's how governments always function, and he thinks that's what presidents are supposed to do. Because he says what, what I don't. What I don't get though he is how come the U.S. indicted everybody around him but him. They didn't indict everyone. Like you got the, the the port authority, you got you know the the other they people in the cabinet. Everybody was indicted but him. They didn't indict anyone. They put sanctions. They, they yeah they sanctions, sanctions. My bad sanctions. And 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 a sanction is is meaningless. It's meaningless. Yeah, it, they, a, it seemed like they wanted, they wanted they wanted like the Arab Spring in Liberia when they did that. Like no, after after no. that, the state department well, I mean, said, "All right, I mean, Liberian people." I mean, people let's, be let's be real. Be, let's be real. Liberia in its current state, and this sums it up. Liberia is just an American ignorant puppet state. They do what America tells them to. They run to America. They run to the U.S. Embassy. They're not real, and it's it's only going to take us, people in the diaspora, and people who know better, to go in and fix that situation. Because if we don't come in as the diaspora and people who know better, that, that train wreck going to keep running down on, yeah. on that train well. Even the, the the opposition, I mean, I've never seen a more coonish, buffoonish opposition in my life. These people are weaponizing white supremacy against Liberia, you know, lobbying U.S. Congress to put sanctions against their opponents. The reason we as people got sanctions put against them is because you've got these coon opposition people over here instead of doing it in Liberia to lobbying Liberian Congress, they're in America lobbying U.S. Congress against Liberia. Uh, what does that do? It does nothing. It's just, you know, because everyone worships America, so, oh, the white people put sanctions on you, you know. No. Make your own country put sanctions on your own criminals. Yeah. You know, that's a power move. If you're going to take lobbying dollars, you're going to take millions of dollars and lobby U.S. Congress, Take millions of dollars and lobby Liberian Congress and see how that works for you. It'll work far better because they're the ones that have the power to do something. But you see how, how it works? Right? They can bribe American congressmen, but they can't bribe their own. If you're going to commit bribery, because <laughs> it is bribery, lobbying is bribery. Pretty much. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. You had Global Witness put out a report talking about. Liberian government officials took bribes, thirty thousand dollars each, from Exxon Mobil. But they didn't focus on the company that gave the bribes. They focused on these these dimwits who took the bribes. And I'm like, bribery. There's two criminals involved in a bribe. That person who takes the bribe, and the person who gives the bribe. It's just like prostitution. You're the prostitute. You're a criminal. You're the John. You're also a criminal. So you can't mm -hmm. sit there and only write a report condemning these third world backward, poorly educated people who took money from this corporate vulture who's using cash violence to manipulate people and you don't mention that. But Liberians are running around, oh, oh, you guys took bribes. Who gave the bribes? And why are they giving bribes? Bribery mm -hmm. isn't at gunpoint, right? The person who's giving the bribe in those kinds of circumstances, it's usually not even solicited. They come with it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the mentality and the mindset of even the opposition is messed up. These people don't even respect the humanity of the people they want to rule over. They just want to get in power and do what George Weah is doing more competently. They want to be more competent coons. That's all they're vying for. Mm -hmm. They're angry. They're angry because Wea is an incompetent coon. And their argument, literally, their argument is, I am a more competent coon than George Wea, America. <laughs> That's their argument. 
I mean, to understand the point, we got people in Liberia lobbying for the uh, non-Negro clause to be removed, saying that it's racist, it's outdated. You know, we got Lebanese people coming in. We got, you know, businessmen from Turkey. And it's just like... They have They're not even arguing that. The, the, they don't even care because they have economic self-determination in Liberia. I've never met a Lebanese person that wanted Liberian citizenship. Really? They I lived don't in Liberia it. for nine <laughs> years. I lived there for nine years. I worked for government. I worked for the United Nations. I never met, not one time, a Lebanese man say, boy, woe is me. I wish I could be a citizen of Liberia. I've never run into that person. They got that cash. <laughs> exactly. I've never run into but, that person. But you know what? I, I appreciate you guys being up here. I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, yeah. kind of doing, uh, doing the good, with spreading the good word about Liberia. I gotta go cook these short ribs. Um, you guys I gotta, I gotta, I gotta hurry. I gotta, um, I got, I got some pop. I got some coconut shrimp and some uh, fish sticks. Look at, look at. So, uh, yeah. hey, 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 listen, hey, listen, brother. I'm, I'm just putting it in the crock pot. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just searing it and I'm putting it in the crock pot. I just put mine in the <laughs> oven, heat it up to 450, let it for like 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, my, I'm, I'm gonna be in the crock pot for six hours. You got that frozen stuff. All right, gentlemen, it's yeah. been a pleasure. Jabari, thank you. You did an awesome job. Um, brother, what's your name? Uh, Blue Sox. Baker. Oh, okay. All right, fine. That's your name. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, Blue. That wraps everything it, it's been a up. pleasure, Blue. It's been a pleasure. Um, Y'all take right. care. Okay. You too. You too, guys. And that sums up a great BIO show. Make sure you guys like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you comment down below. Sign up to the website at baioafricstand.org slash register. Please, we are trying to get as many people to sign up so we can start doing some initiatives within Liberia. If you are a member, we have the lounge, and we would like to see you there. And with that, y'all, this is Jabari, and y'all have a great rest of the weekend or this Sunday, and have a great start to your week.